Hello everybody, and this is going to be a Faceless Void Hero Guide. Yes! My gratitude. And I would like to give a disclaimer that this is the very end of 7.29, but this guide is meant to be a very general way to view Faceless Void, and we're going to be talking about how there's two different ways that I think Faceless Void can be drafted, and how he's currently popular in 7.29, or at least the build that's more popular. He's kind of fallen off in terms of pick rate. We're going to envision which one you're going to be picking, and in what metas each one is good. Banana slam jam. So I think Faceless Void, to start, is a hero that is defined by the popular meta items. Uh, if you guys recall last year, Mask of Madness MKB were two of the best damage items in the entire game. And thus, Faces Void, a lover of buying Mask of Madness MKB, was one of the most popular heroes in Dota, and thus bought those items every single game. So that leads me into saying that there are two types of Faces Voids, both of which I believe are based on the current meta. Usually one is way more popular than the other. The first Faces Void plays off of Chronosphere. And what I mean by plays off of Chronosphere is it means that he intends to have his impact in the game as well as his impact in fights to revolve purely around Chronosphere. Which means that you look at the game, you say your team has a lot of burst damage, the, the meta is buying Mask of Madness MKB, Mask of Madness Maelstrom, you know, Daedalus, BKB Refresher, these types of items uh, where your whole point is to win the fight in the Chronosphere. This is the build of Void that we're not going to be talking about too much today. Why? Because in 7.29, the popular items are Dragon Lance, Sanjinyasha, Scotty, Butterfly, uh, Satanic. These are a lot of the popular carry items, which means that oftentimes Faces Void, who was picked a lot at the start of the patch, is not very viable. But that does leave us with a build for Faces Void that's absolutely viable, still in this current meta, and something you should always be on the lookout for. And that build I call revolving around Time Walk, as well as Time Lock. The biggest contrast between these two builds is that Chronosphere relies on you winning the fight in the first 4-5 to five seconds. You know, read the ability, that's how long it lasts. But these other two spells are very efficient damage reduction and free damage spells. So Time Lock is effectively a, you know, 24% compounding because bashes can bash for themselves. So maybe about 28%, so, you know, I don't know the perfect math on it. Uh, maybe it's even higher. Percent damage to bash, and it's a double damage basically because the bonus damage is pretty ass. So it's free damage. And what I mean by free damage is it doesn't, cast any ma doesn't cost any mana, doesn't cost any time. It's obviously just built into your right clicks. And then Time Walk is two seconds of damage re reduction every six seconds. And once you get the level 20 talent, it's two damage, two seconds of damage reduction every four seconds, which is pretty insane if you think about it. You're effectively able to choose what damage you remove without the talent, 33% of it, and with the talent, 50% of it. And it's assuming you're not choosing to use it right after you take a lot of damage. So with this in mind, it kind of goes with the talents. The first build, oftentimes you'll take the damage talents. Maybe the strength at level 10 in case you're afraid of getting bursted. So if you're going the Mask of Madness MKB build, you can look to go for the time lock damage, the attack speed, as well as the Chronosphere, because that's what your build is about. But on this build, uh, the time walk and time lock build, it's all about the survivability talents. I've told you kind of about what these builds entail, and now I'm going to talk about prim predominantly the time walk and time lock build. We're going to be going through a replay um, in 7.29, but it really does stand um, the point that I'm trying to make past this path. So one of the first indicators that it's a good time walk and time lock build game is when your teammates have a lot of built-in damage or saves. When I say built-in damage, it means that you don't have to be the one dealing all the damage, and you can just be a front line for your team. Built-in saves go really well with the time walk and time lock build because you're playing for long, drawn-out fights. You're playing to use time walk multiple times. You're planning to take long engagements that can you can pick and choose who you're going on because your time walk's so low cooldown. And if I look at our rosters right now, our lineup, we have... Nyx, who's pretty good damage, and Pango, who's pretty good damage, and then we have Wyvern and Oracle, who are also pretty good saves. So this is like the perfect game to just go for a tanky build. So not only that, but when you're looking at the tanky build, you also want to be against a minimal amount of disables, especially in the early game. It's not as important in the later sources of the game, 
But when we're looking at cores like Medusa and Mars and Monkey King, yes, the Mars and Monkey King have stuns, but they're not very long. The Rubik Telekinesis is not very long. And Shadow Demon, I can probably just time walk out of his disruption. So, like, if you look at these spells, not only is it kind of low on disable, but it's pretty low on burst damage for a long time. I have saves to make it easier for me. And it's also very hard to kill them during Chronosphere. Mars is very tanky. Medusa is very tanky. If Monkey King's already ulted, he's really tanky. And they also have Shattered Demon to save. So it's a combination of my teammates being good with my build, but it's also that I can't rely on Chronosphere to win the fights. So now we're going to be talking about the way Faces Void wants to play when it comes to this type of build. Levels 1 and 2, he doesn't generally want to contest. So it is important to note that oftentimes you want to use a lot of defensive creep aggro and you also want your support to pull as often as possible. Because Faceless Void is pretty independent, doesn't really need help in order to secure the lane, but he also doesn't really help you. So he kind of wants the support to play away from him, something you can communicate to your supports, and needs maybe like level 2 or 3 at least before he wants to start fighting. Once he starts getting a few points up in his time lock, once he maybe gets a point in time dilation, that's when he can start contesting the opponent. So we're going to talk a little bit about starting items. So starting items really boil down to, does the opponent have a lot of spammable spells? If the answer is yes, or I'll always buy a stick. Because the stick means that I'm going to get a lot of charges from those spammable spells, but it also means that time dilation will be incredibly impactful. And whenever I'm looking to buy a stick on carry, I need to be able to use the mana to trade back. And ever since they added damage on time dilation, it makes it a really effective trade for you to be able to pop those stick charges and use those time dilation just as a harass tool. Um, and I'll look to maybe take it around level 2, perhaps level 3. The latest I'll take time dilation is level 4. It's just too strong. Um, I'll, my build will usually end up being 114 by level 7 or 441. So time walk, if you look at this scaling on it, only goes down in cooldown. And the cooldown, you don't really feel the effect of it until you get level 4 time walk. So most of the time, I'm either leaving it at one point or I'm putting it at four points, which means that since time dilation is not really a spell that helps you farm, then I'm not going to max this out because I'm a carry. We're not talking about support faces void, by the way, that, you know, you can listen to Dubu for that one. And then time lock is the one that helps me trade for free and also speeds up my farm by giving me more, more right click damage. So that's the idea that I'm looking for with my skill build. But back to the item build. So if they don't have a lot of spammable spells, then I'm likely not going to take a magic stick which means that I'll probably delay the time dilation until level 3, maybe even just level 4, like I said. And I'll go for some more stat items, like Circlet, Slipper, Quelling Blade, and a Stick. Um, and that just buffs up my right-click damage. So Faces Void often does not go for something like an Orb of Venom. He can, but usually it's if his support is a huge threat. Because Faces Void early game, compared to a lot of other carries, has just absolutely no damage. You know, once he gets to level 7, with max time lock, maybe like a Mask of Madness or full treads in a Wraith Band, he can start being a little bit scary with those right clicks. But early on, the Orb of Venom is not usually that impactful because you don't scare them enough to make them run away from you, which is when the Orb of Venom comes into play. In the laning stage, I like to avoid Wraith Band if possible. Um, if I'm against like a Slardar off lane, a Legion off lane, heroes that are going to harass me a lot with right clicks, then I'll for sure have to go for one. But it's only a necessity if I go for a Wraith Band just because Faceless Void does need farming items and it's not in the form of just giving himself stats. You know, um, we're going to get to that in a second. But I usually like to get treads as soon as possible. Um, and we're going to go into our four farming items for Faces Void. Faces Void will almost always buy one of these four items. Midas, Mask of Madness, Maelstrom, or Battle Fury. And it all really depends on the patch. Like right now, Mask of Madness and Battle Fury aren't exactly good items. Maelstrom's considered an okay item, but most of the time we'd go for Maelstrom in the current patch. Midas is also considered a bit too slow. But we have to be able to gauge the pace of the game. So Mask of Madness is I need to get a couple early Chronosphere kills, and I also need the sustain so that if I'm at full HP, I'm not going to die. But going an early Mask of Madness here doesn't feel very good because I can't use it against their heroes because Monkey King is a physical damage mid, Mars is a physical damage offlaner. And so if I were to pop Mask of Madness to farm, I could just die if they ever had a ward on me. So rushing a Mag Mask of Madness feels pretty bad. But at the same time, Maelstrom, I don't think I'm going to be able to keep up with Dusa. So I need to be able to scale, and I also need to be able to contribute to the game earlier than a Battle Fury would warrant. So in this particular game, I choose to go for a Midas. 
One thing to note, I did a replay analysis a while back uh, of a faceless void against a Darkseer. And lanes like Darkseer that are heavy harass, Mask of Madness is almost always a must. If Faceless Void doesn't have the meta to buy a Battle Fury, which is currently in 7.29, not the case, Mask of Madness is really your only option for sustain. Which means that if you were to buy a Midas and lose your tower because of it, that's really bad. So when I'm deciding between Mask of Madness or Midas, usually it comes down to whether or not I can occupy my lane with a Mask of Madness without it, with a Midas without it. And a lot of times on Faceless Void, my job is to be independent, survivable farmer for like the first 10 minutes. I don't generally like to TP anywhere on Faces Void to be able to farm. Because when you're in the first 10 minutes of the game, you don't want to waste your Chronosphere. You don't want to feel any, the need to stop farming to use your Chronosphere. So what that means is you want to be able to TP places with your Chronosphere. So... That means he usually likes to stay in his safe lane, if possible. That's the dream, because he can either have his teammates gank for him to help defend his top tower, or he can take opportunistic TPs to gank other lanes. But in the meanwhile, he's farming. The really important thing about Faceless Void is, since he farms really slow at the start of the game, that you can't fuck up like the first 10 to 15 minutes, because he doesn't have a very good recovery method other than going like, heavy farming items and taking forever to come online. He's a snowball hero in regards to farming. He's either able to survive on the map, or he's not. The heroes I don't like picking Faceless Void into are heroes with di like constant disables or heavy amounts of burst damage or pushing power. Because if we look at Faceless Void, if we're going off the time lock and time walk build, you want to be able to spam your abilities, which means long disables such as Doombringer, such as Slardar with his continuous stuns, something like a DK, something like a Kunkka to catch you. A lot of stuns over time are things that can be really frustrating, Axe included. On the other hand, if you're playing with the Chronosphere build or just a, a meta where Faces Void team fighting's pretty heavy, then heroes like Beastmaster can be an absolute nightmare. Uh, usually it's not only pushing heroes that can threaten your towers, but it's also heroes that can threaten you. So Beastmaster, I think, is Faces Void's worst matchup in the entire game because he can kill you with his roar and he can take his tower take your tower with his uh with his summons but right now that's currently not the case but i will be concerned if i look at the opponent lineup and i see heroes like luna leshrac nature's prophet uh these heroes that are going to kill your towers super early and there's really nothing faces void can do about it maybe you can stop one tower push with like a chronosphere but that's about it hit mids that don't mind getting chronoed like Death Prophet, that also have silences, can be super annoying. It's hard to chrono heroes like Puck. I love picking Void against mid laners that are immobile and don't have stuns. Uh, the, the heroes I like to pick Void against are the ones that you can see them coming, and the ones that if you were to time walk on top of them, they're going to get chronoed. Those are the mid laners I like to pick Faces Void against. So I talk about SF, I talk about Invoker, I talk about Lena. Um, a lot of mid laners do have the burst, so a lot of the heroes that counter you are the mid and off laners, because those are the heroes with the disables and the burst, and when I look out for them in the draft, those are the heroes I really don't, uh, those are the heroes that will usually deter me from picking Faces Void. And because Faces Void is so heavily countered by burst damage, uh, that's why saves like Oracle go really well with him. Warlock, Oracle, Dazzle if it's a Dazzle patch, Wyvern, perfect heroes to make Faces Void just that much easier to play. When it comes to carry to carry matchups, it's more about what the carry is going to make you do. And what I mean by that is, I would always prefer to do the time walk and time lock build if possible. It makes void much easier. The chronosphere build is much more situational. What I mean by that is, if you want to go for the chronosphere build and they ever draft like a single save or a single hero that makes it really difficult for you to chronosphere people, then the build kind of falls apart. So when I think of heroes that make you go for the chronosphere build, I'm thinking of stuff like Terrorblade because of Sunder and his ability to kill you pretty fast. PL, Anti-Mage, uh, Morphling, these types of heroes that drow that you just have to straight up burst down or it doesn't feel good. The heroes I like to pick them against are heroes, the carries that just present themselves, you chrono them, uh, and they can't do enough damage to you during time walk or d before you time walk, or you can just time walk their spells off. So I usually like Faces Void against Jug, Slark, Lifestealer, Wraith King, 
uh, Weaver, sometimes heroes like Spectre, Troll Warlord, Gyrocopter, Luna, depending on the patch. Heroes like Luna, for instance, are only really an issue if the rest of their team also pushes the tempo really early. A lot of Faces Void, other than the offlaners like Doom and Beastmaster, he doesn't have horrible matchups. Uh, it's more so the game plan that the opponent's representing. If the opponent team has overwhelming amounts of stuns and burst, or overwhelming amounts of tower push and early lane pressure, that's when Faces Void feels really bad to pick. I, I wouldn't feel as much guided by individual heroes as I would by looking at the opponent and seeing that much of a game plan one way or the other, because those are Faces Void's major weaknesses. In the, in the replay that we're using as an example, this game I go for the Band of Elven Skin early as the component of my treads because I needed a little bit of extra base damage against Mars. I also went for the wand because I was against a lot of ability usages. Then I realized that I didn't really want to rotate anywhere. Pango's a pretty farm-heavy offlaner. Wyvern's a pretty farm-heavy mid laner. And I can't really bully this Mars without being scared. The thing about Faces Void is he has to put himself right in the face of danger in order to be strong. So I asked myself, if I put myself right in the face of danger, what will happen? And I'm afraid of like a Monkey King rotation or like a Rubik lift into a Mars Spear and just dying. So with that in mind, I didn't think I was threatened underneath my own tower because I can, if I see them coming, I can just time walk away. But I also don't think I can exert any pressure on the map. I just want to stay where I am. So what that means is I want to stay where I am and I can't exert pressure. And I also, like I said earlier, didn't feel comfortable popping Mask of Madness. This is the rare situation where I will go Midas. Those three things. Oftentimes, if I'm going for Mask of Madness, I'll often go Mask of Madness before Treads. Uh, if I get a really good laning stage where I want to play to be super aggressive, Treads are the better damage item consistently. If I'm playing more of this defensive route where I'm not afraid of their burst damage, but of, of sustain something like an Underlord or a Darkseer, that's when I'll go Mask of Madness before Treads. These are kind of the laning stage builds that you can go for. If you're going to go for the treads because you want to fight back and be aggressive and you don't need sustain, but you are strong, that's when you go Maelstrom. Because that says to me that you want to be able to control the area, you want to be able to be a threat, and you also want to accelerate your farm. So I know that seems complicated, but that really is the decision making between Maelstrom, Midas, and Mask of Madness. Uh, you can actually go any two of these items, Mask of Madness, Maelstrom, Midas, Mask of Madness, and Midas, Maelstrom. All three of those combos are absolutely reasonable. They add up to about the same as a Battle Fury. So the difference between a Battle Fury and the rest of these items is that Battle Fury accelerates your farm a lot because you can spam Time Walk and your hero doesn't have an innate way to clear camps. The problem is you do absolutely no damage in Chronosphere. The way Faces Void works, since he relies a lot on Bash, is he needs attack speed. So if you go for a Battle Fury, it's 4,300 gold that gives you no attack speed. So, if you compare that to a Maelstrom that's 2700 gold, yes, it doesn't give you attack speed, but it does build into an item, Mjolnir, that eventually gives you attack speed. And it also allows you to buy something like a Yasha um, earlier, about the same price as a Yasha Maelstrom into a Battle Fury, as, as a Battle Fury is, that gives you a bit of attack speed to work with. So, the times that you buy Battle Fury is when Battle Fury is a really popular meta item. You don't threaten the offlaner, and you need some sustain. And you want to, like, hard scale. Battle Fury says, I'm playing for, like, four slots, five slots. I'm probably playing for the time walk, time lock build. And I'm also going to go, like, Ags and a Manta and stuff like this that just says, I'm going to spam my abilities off cooldown and I want to play the long game. But right now in the current patch, that just doesn't really work. Because you're Faceless Void going Battle Fury and you're against a Luna that has Dragon Lance Manta at the same time that you have a Battle Fury. But in some patches, that could be okay. I usually prefer it against heroes that can't really group up, but also don't really threaten me. Something like a Jug, if it's a bad Jug game. Something like a Anti-Mage. These types of heroes that are kind of slower paced or don't threaten me is when I'll choose to go Battle Fury. So we've gone over the early item game builds. Uh, let's continue to proceed. So in this game, I go for the Midas. And my entire idea is... Let the lane push into me, because my hero sucks at pushing the lane out. Very rarely will you find games where Faces Void will outpush the other guy. The only time he outpushes the other guy is when he's the one that kills the other guy. So it's his threat of Chronosphere and his ability to bring them down full to zero or harass them constantly. But like I said, I was a little bit fearful of Mars, but this time around, since Mars is forced to leave, you know, I'm going to be freed up. So I'm either waiting for Mars to be forced to leave, 
Until then, I'm consistently playing passive. But look at the way Faces Void is. He doesn't apply a ton of tower pressure, so it's really important, since he's so survivable and independent, that you just shove lanes into their tower, but oftentimes you're not actually hitting them, right? You're not actually hitting these towers, because you need to get every little item you can, and the only time you hit towers is when you feel like perfectly safe to do so, which we're going to see here. So the enemy team is forced to go away from me, and this is an example of what I mean by... I'm just chilling in my lane, and the reason why I haven't TP'd to farm or go anywhere else is this exact reason. Because I look at the map, I see two heroes bottom, I see two heroes mid, a Monkey King that's below half HP going on my teammates, and I have an opportunity to Chronosphere. And since I had decent early game damage from my supports, I can go for the Midas and still have a bit of a threat during the Chronosphere. And so now... It's all about just chilling and not losing towers to the best of our capabilities. And notice how I've skipped boots. The beauty of Faces Void is if there's other items you need, a Midas to scale, a Mask of Madness for sustain. But I said earlier I didn't want to go Mask of Madness in lane, but the game's kind of broken down now. I'm going to be jungling more after I'm forced to rotate out. I don't need boots to play my hero. I'm not telling you skip boots on Faces Void. But heroes like Faces Void, PA, Anti-Mage... They can sometimes afford to skip boots before their bigger items because they have innate damage built in and they have gap close and farming abilities. So like anti-mage blink, PA blink, in this case, faces void time walk. Notice how in order to contribute, I did not need boots. In order to survive, I did not need boots. So it's just something worth noting. Boots are definitely a strong consideration, especially if you want to be aggressive in lane. Um, but now notice how top I was kind of like defensively posturing underneath my tower to make sure they don't take it it's the same idea mid here you know just play near the tower that the opponent can push it into me but i'm just going to defend the tower so here i'm going to stack ancients because i'm going for the mask of madness but notice it's always my responsibility on the map to just clean up waves under tower because that's all faces void does he doesn't pressure towers he doesn't push lanes really fast but the last thing you want to be is completely freaking useless and just jungling all game so I find a lane that I think I need to defend. Earlier is top. Now it's mid after I use my Chronosphere. And I'm just chilling, picking up the wave and leaving. I'm not trying to pressure. I'm not worried about pressuring the opponent tower. But here's the crucial moment in the game that in the past I'll be too lazy and I'm not going to fix. So notice how I'm consistently going through the same mo motions, right? I'm... Defending the tower, rotate into jungle. If I see a threat at the tower, I leave jungle early, go back to lane. That's been what I'm doing forever. But right now, we're in the mode of not wanting to fight because we don't have Chronosphere. That seems pretty obvious. But if a fight breaks out, I've emphasized on my replay analysis time and time again that you need to either join the fight or immediately apply pressure somewhere else. So I'm in a situation where I see the opponent carry top and my mid laner is engaging him, right? So right away, I know that it's very likely based on the fact that everyone's missing and two important heroes in the game, my mid laner and his carry are fighting top. So notice how I'm like, oh, there's no pressure on my tower. I'm going to go back to my ancients. But then I see what's happening. I'm like, oh shit, I got to be ready to apply pressure to this tower. The situations you don't want to find yourself in are ones where you are farming ancients or like farming a hard camp and you don't have chronosphere. You look at a fight. Your team lost it, and you're like, shit, now what? You know, because at that point, you're choosing between showing up to a fight with no chrono, which sucks, or hitting a neutral camp while your team loses a fight and loses a tower, both of which suck. So these are the moments in the game that on heroes like Faces Void that don't apply a ton of pressure, anti-mage is kind of similar, that you do start hitting mid-wave. And my team is fortunately going to win this fight, but even if the opponent had won this fight, say 3 for 0, 4 for 0... They may group up and take top tower, but I'm going to take a trade in the mid lane at the same time. And these types of trades are super important because I can't contribute to that fight because I don't have Chronosphere. And the awesome thing is these are the rare moments that you're not going to get very often. That's why I called it a rare moment. So notice how on Faces Void, what you can do is when the opponent team groups up somewhere, in this case, they're like respawning. You, there's a reason why they're not here right now. You can aggressively time walk. I learned this from, from Sumail. Uh, he played Faces Void in a way that I'd never seen before. This was like maybe two years ago when he started playing carry on. Um, I don't remember what team he played on. But what he did was, he just postured. You're just annoying, you know? If, if a Faces Void time walks on Dusa right now, imagine what the opponent's going to do. They're all respawning, so they can't kill me yet. But they're, they're, the enemy carry is running at my carry. You know, that's the opponent's perspective. And these are the crucial moments on Faces Void that I've learned from other players that you really need to look out for. 
So what I do is I'm just like, heh, threatening this guy, right? I'm not investing any abilities. I'm not using cooldowns. I'm not committing. But what this does and why it's so important on Faceless Void is because you have the survivability to do it, but you also don't have the farm speed to warrant being highly passive. So the, this is so important for two different reasons. And so what this does is it makes the enemy team group up around their carry, which they don't want to do with a hero like Dusa, all these other flash farming heroes that almost every carry in the game is going to farm faster than you when you're Faceless Void. And then also you can kind of just walk away. So this is the way that a hero that farms kind of slowly can even the playing field when it comes to farm speed, right? So we just force reactions. We have Chronosphere, but we don't feel the need to do anything because we just took a tower and we want to play for a bit of efficiency. But notice how earlier I played away from my team, looked to TP in with Chrono. Same idea here. It's kind of like a Spectre approach, but, you know, it's not the exact same. I do have to actually TP to the fight. So I, team, I see my team TPing in. I TP in as well. Same idea as mid lane. I don't want to be impatient with my abilities. Faces Void doesn't mind taking long fights. End up getting the Chronosphere onto two. Always looking to target the people who have saves or waiting for them to use their abilities with saves. So in this case, Shadow Demon. The enemy team had like an Oracle or a Wyvern. Heroes that can counter your Chronosphere. Always wait till they show themselves. Don't just like blow your load super early. Same idea here though. Just going to push in the lane and back off. And this is kind of showing like their lack of damage. Um, I felt really comfortable with Mars being dead, that I was allowed to show like that, and I had a save support. And now we're taking like another long engagement, which maybe was a bit forced by me. Um, maybe even though I was comfortable enough to stay alive, I shouldn't have stayed there because I kind of baited my team to come back. These are kind of decisions that you can think to yourself. But notice how I'm not really under threat this whole time. And it ends up actually turning into a good fight for us. And I've noticed on myself that if I play carry and I'm not the one dying, and... Uh, the enemy team's investing resources into trying to kill me. It usually feels pretty good on Faceless Void specifically. So if you're not fighting with Chronosphere, you're pretty much playing the outskirts of the fight as you saw there with time with time dilation. That's pretty much it, you know? And looking to commit if opponents like Shadow Demon use Disruption, then you time walk, time dilation on top of them, and then beat them down. I didn't go for Maelstrom. I didn't go for Diffusal against Medusa. I don't think items like Diffusal, unless it's like the most broken item in the patch, are viable on Faces Void. Because Faces Void needs a nice combination of damage and survivability. And he also has a natural gap close. If you compare him to a hero like Ursa, who like needs to push his 100 range Urshock and then catch you, and then does a shit ton of damage once he catches you, to Faces Void, who can usually catch you. He has no issues actually getting on top of you, half the reasons you would buy a Diffusal. And... He needs to be able to survive once he time walks. So defusal type items, heavy damage items, usually you don't want to go for them. And it's even worse because you don't have a way to built in to farm. So that's why, you know, Maelstrom and Battle Fury are damage items, but you're willing to potentially buy them because they help you farm. So a lot of people in my chat were asking me why I didn't buy defusal against Medusa. Unless I have a Magnus because he gives me in power, I'm never buying items like defusal. I don't want to say never. Very unlikely to buy items like defusal. But notice here, kind of rinse and repeat. You know, Chronosphere is up, play away from my team, be ready to TP. Um, but I'm just playing for my own farm consistently, not forcing anything. We're looking for an opportunity down here. Doesn't quite work. I think Nick's kind of botched it, but he wasn't expecting the Monkey King to play it that way. And because I TP bottom, we kind of just have to give up mid. And notice how it's the same approach, never forgetting to push lanes. I'm trying to isolate the opponents because Faces Void is so good against one or two heroes. It's really hard to kill Faces Void unless you bring three or four heroes. In games where you die to like one hero straight up, those are like the worst Faces Void games. But notice how I'm constantly applying pressure bottom rather than choosing to farm my Ancients. A hero like Luna, Medusa, they're going to retreat and farm their Ancients. <laughs> While Faces Void, uh, we're not going to talk about that. Go ahead and skip forward on the editing. We're just going to... You know, we're not going to talk about this. We were just baiting Rubik to come back in. Perfect play by BSJ. Uh, and yeah, it's a beautiful play as we get the Rubik kill in the end. Perfect zero for one trade. Also killed the Mars, I think. Yes, no, maybe. Baits the entire enemy team bottom when he has a 3k deficit against him. Perfect play by BSJ. Because I want to apply pressure and I don't clear these Ancients very fast, I don't often retreat to my triangle unless there's just nothing else for my hero to do. Um, and right there I did have Chronosphere, so I wanted to play aggressively on the map if possible. But notice with the build that I'm going for, I'm always putting myself in front of my team once I have this crucial Sanjin Yasha survivability item. A very important item in this build, 
And if the meta Sound Janyasha is a good item, this build will almost always reign true for Faceless Void. And it just allows you, even though you do less damage, to just constantly be in the fight, spamming Time Walk. And the opponent doesn't feel good committing onto me because I've got safe supports behind me. And I'm also 2600 HP at 22 minutes in the game because I've taken both of the 9 strength and the 300 HP talents, and I have an SNY. So it looks like I don't do all that much damage against heroes like Dusa and Mars, but if they can't kill me, Vase's Void's eventually going to kill you. He suffers against heroes that prevent him from time walking at this stage in the game. So heavy amounts of burst, but you can also consider mana burn, such as like Diffusal or Anti-Mage to be very annoying. So whenever I have Chronosphere, I don't like to chase the opponent around the map. Notice how whenever I have Chronosphere, I just put myself in the area that either has an objective or somewhere that's going to force a reaction from an opponent. Or I'm placing myself hyperly passive away from my team. So the, there's two ways that you look at this. In the first iteration where I'm playing aggressively on the map near an objective, that means I think I'm strong enough to try to force an objective. The alternative means I don't think I'm strong enough to force an objective, but I'm willing to fight. So in the early examples where I was still farming up, didn't really have that many items. Notice I was playing hyper-passive on the map, ready to TP with my Chronosphere. Notice there hasn't been a single fight on the map that I haven't been ready to TP to, other than the time I missed the fight mid because I tried to TP bottom to kill the Monkey King. I have always have my ability to show up to the fight, but I don't feel the need to use Chronosphere. I don't think of it as like, okay, I have Chronosphere, go kill somebody. It's, I have Chronosphere, that has to mean something. That's kind of like how I look at it. So I'm either posturing aggressively, or I'm constantly able to show up to the fight. So in this case, we force Roche. I don't want to chase people around because every second I'm running around the map, I'm not farming. It's kind of how I look at Faces Void, since he wants to be farming as often as possible because he does not farm very fast. So this is a moment where, similar to earlier, where I decided to like turn around at the Ancients and go hit the, go hit the mid tower. It's the same idea. Don't get baited by this. Don't play Faces Void and go hit Triangle just because it's 2230 or 2330 into the game. I have an Aegis. I'm really strong. I need to look like I'm really strong when it comes to the way I farm. So I immediately go, nope, go back bottom and push it out. And even if this doesn't look like I'm doing much, I am making anybody on their team scared to come bottom by themselves because it's a faces void with Aegis, so they can't really kill me and I could potentially threaten them. And I'm also going to push in a lane. So in this case, my team, I think, is making a big mistake by not playing around me. Um, you know, wherever I go, I had to clean up a wave bottom. My team should enable their Aegis carry. I'm pretty strong, but I'm strong in the version of tankiness. I don't really want to go to them. I want them to come to me. Um, early on, when I was weak, I went to them. Notice how that dynamic works with Faces Void. And even though um, my team loses a couple heroes, notice how the opponent team is forced to react to me once again. And I'm perfectly fine with them going on me here. And this is the benefit of the SNY and the Ultimate Orb. Even if, by some chance, I had died there, um, you know, that's what my whole build is about, is making them use spells on me and surviving. So if I'm scared of a spell hitting me and that means death, I'll go for the BKB with this type of build. But if that means that I think they can afford to cast spells on me and I'll still live, I don't want to go BKB. Because if I BKB, they're not going to use spells on me, which means they're using those spells on the rest of my team. So that's kind of how I view BKB on Faces Void. And the beauty of this game is I'm just buying into, I don't need more damage. I just need the ability to keep hitting them. And Scotty is super good against range course. And also Scotty is just the best item in the patch. So if it's a better item future, such as, you know, Butterfly or Satanic or anything like that, I could go for it. But Sanj and Yasha Scotty is a pretty standard build for any carry in 7.29. It's mainly just the idea that I want to be tanky, but also be a threat. And the slow makes me stick on to my targets. And notice how I'm just constantly hitting buildings. It's the biggest part. Even though I don't have Chronosphere, I'm still strong on the map. And that's the big part about this build is, yes, Chronosphere makes you a scary teamfighter, but the the play on the map is what makes Faces Void this build good. I've always been up in the face of the opponent. They constantly feel like they have to come to me, and that's when Faces Void feels the most powerful. So a lot of you watching are probably like, what the fuck is this skill build? So if I'm playing for teamfights, and I feel like I'm either all in on the Chronosphere, or we really need the damage from time dilation, I'm going to max my spells, because... You know, those spells are really important. They're strong spells. You know, you look at Chronosphere, you look at Time Dilation, they're pretty strong spells. But at the end of the day, if I think the my job in the game is mainly to tank, why not go stats? Chronosphere doesn't lower cooldown, goes up in mana cost, and only goes up by 0.5 seconds. Honestly, pretty minimal compared to two all stats at every minute of the game where they're also trying to kill me. You know, those eight all stats bottom might have saved me. Um, and then Time Dilation, 
Uh, I also didn't max this out partially because they had Rubik. Uh, and one of the ways I could die was Rubik stealing time dilation, which he did multiple times and killing me with it. So I just saw this game, that this ability wasn't necessarily needed for damage, and this ability was not that much... I wasn't relying on it that hard. So I just maxed out stats to enable my tankiness build. And when you play this tankiness build, you always go for the time walk max. Um, if you're going for the Mask of Madness MKB, once again, you definitely take the 40 attack speed talent. So constantly running at the opponent, just kind of swooping across the map. I'm like a plus one for everybody with this build. I'm not looking to solo kill people. I'm looking for opportunities where the opponent overcommits onto me or they put themselves in front of one of my teammates. That's a threat. In this case, that was the Pangolier and the Nyx. And I just connect to them. Mask of Madness in this build will always turn into a Sanj and Yash, or sorry, a Satanic and a Butterfly. Notice how my teammates are always the ones setting up. With this build, if you don't have Chronosphere, just look and see what your teammates are doing. Otherwise, play really aggressively on the map, but you don't need to kill anybody. You just need to farm aggressively. And eventually, the enemy team will separate because you're a hero that can be pretty much anywhere on the map and it's really hard to kill you without four or five heroes. And you just kind of run around the map continuously waiting for your teammates to set up opportunities. You know, if you're in lower MMRs and your teammates are really never looking for kills, that's life. You know, you're a six-slotted Void eventually, and that's pretty freaking strong. Void is one of the strongest late-game carries in the entire game, especially when he's allowed to go this build. Because Time Walk, in terms of raw survivability for any carry, is probably the strongest ability in the game. So, things to consider uh, is the Ag Shard. Oftentimes, I'll wait to buy it. It is a very good Ag Shard uh, in the current iteration. It gives you 400 Time Walk cast range. And it gives you the ability to reverse time walk, which um, after 1.5 seconds after you land, you can choose to go back. This can be really good for time walking in and using time dilation and backing out. It can be really good for forcing reactions to things. It can be really good for like fake retreating. I do it in this game. I'll even show it here. Um, but the shard doesn't help you do more damage during chrono and it doesn't help you farm. So I kind of need like a lot of other items before I get it. I'm always happy to take it from second Roche. You know, I assume Ag Shard's not going to be given on second Roche after this patch. So, you know, maybe the relevance of that comment won't be very long. A lot of good tier three neutral items for Void. Don't want to go too much into neutral items because of the patch. But Faces Void, notice how I'm constantly putting myself in front of the face of the opponent. My team's playing off map, which is really all that matters to me. I care a lot about what the opponent sees from my team. And notice how I don't feel bad playing by myself because my team is not showing. Just forcing out spells. I'm not actually intending to kill anybody here, but my team said they wanted to connect, so I ended up chronosphering. But the chronosphere wasn't a big part of the fight. It's just to buy time for my team to get here. And this is what this build's all about. Just make people cast spells on you, make them take fights they don't want to take by pressuring their objectives when you have chronosphere. And eventually you wear and tear them down through the war of attrition. Faces Void, very similar to PL, can pick and choose his fights very similar or very carefully. But instead of relying on illusions to do damage and elusiveness to survive, he relies on time walk to pick and choose his fights to do damage and also that to sustain. So this is an example where you can use time walk to uh, kind of fake disengage. Or in that case, I time walked in, used time dilation and backed off. In this case, fake disengage, go back in. Medusa knows how he walked out of the base feeling pretty confident to chase. A lot of different multiple uses of the reverse time walk. It's a pretty cool spell. It's honestly a really strong shard. Um, but yeah, that's really it for Faces Void. Um, when it comes to this build, I'll almost always take Backtrack because it just synergizes with the idea of the build perfectly. And for the last item, I can go Refresher, I can go Daedalus, I can go Rapier if it's a really bad game, uh, BKB if I absolutely need it. Uh, Faces Void's perfectly fine playing with no boots in the hyper-late stages of the game. So you can always drop like the Midas in the boots, go like BKB Refresher, BKB Daedalus, like I said. And this is how I feel about Faces Void. He's one of my favorite heroes. You know, you can probably put this at the start. Um, Strider, I think giving credentials for heroes is always important. Uh, played 335 games of him, 59% win rate. Nothing fantastic, but I'm pretty confident on the hero, one of my most played. And uh, this is my favorite way to play him. I think it's the easiest way to carry. I think you win the game, you carry games by being able to not die, not being able to kill people. Um, Meaning, you win, you carry games by never dying. You don't carry games by solo killing people. So that's my mentality on every carry. And Faces Void in games where they're light on burst and like mediocre on stuns, it's the perfect opportunity to do this type of thing. So I hope you guys enjoyed this guide. Uh, please like, subscribe. Uh, anything else that tells me you like this, comment on the video. 
tell your friends to watch it. Tell your grandma to watch it. Uh, she may not know what she's watching, but she will probably appreciate that you took time out of your day to reach out to her. Uh, and that's it for me. See you next time, guys. Bye.